Today's Bible reading is taken from the book of Matthew, chapter 11, verse 25 to 30. Matthew, chapter 11, 25 to 30. The reading. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son reveals chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Father, we know that your presence here this morning is an act of pure grace. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, for opening the way that we might have access to the presence of the Father. Spirit of God, won't you quiet our souls now? Won't you humble us before your word? And won't you bring us to the Father through the Son? We pray this for your glory and for our good. Amen. A gospel is a political announcement. In his gospel, Matthew is announcing Jesus as the long-awaited king of the kingdom of heaven. And by the end of the gospel, Jesus claims all authority in heaven and on earth for himself. That's about as political as it gets. You can imagine it wasn't all that uh, popular a message with those who thought they had authority. And so uh, we see a, a growing and a, uh, a, an intensifying opposition to this message. In the first 10 chapters, Matthew's building towards this explosive an announcement, all authority in heaven and on earth is mine, says Jesus. Right at the beginning of the gospel, we introduce to Jesus his royal an ancestry, his extraordinary birth, his striking authority in an early ministry of teaching and healing and miracles. And then in chapter 11, we get our first real look at how the world is responding. And as we've been saying, it's no surprise, Jesus isn't exactly welcome everywhere. In fact, in our passage this morning, we have two brackets on either side, two examples of deep hostility and opposition to Jesus. So in Matthew 11, 20 to 24, the verses just before ours, we have Bethsaida, we have Chorazin, two whole cities that reject Jesus. On the other side of the passage, chapter 12, verse 1, more opposition. The religious leaders accuse him of leading a band of outlaws. Whole cities are rejecting Jesus. The religious leadership is rejecting him. The words of Jesus in our passage come at a time in his ministry when he is facing hostility on every side. And that's perhaps what makes them all the more astonishing. How does he respond? He prays a prayer of thanksgiving. Would that be your first choice? Verse 11, verse, chapter 11, verse 25. I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. No one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. The gist of this prayer is that the kingdom of heaven is revealed by the Father and the Son. It's not available to the wise or the understanding. You don't crack the access code through your ingenuity, through your intellect. Entry into the kingdom of heaven is given to us by the gracious will of God. It's a gift. And that means admitting you don't deserve it. No wonder there's opposition. All of that sets us up for verses 28 to 30, which is where we want to focus this morning. We are interested in these verses because in these verses, Jesus turns to his disciples and what he says to them has so much to say to us about the life of discipleship. That's our topic for this morning, the life of discipleship. And so we read verse 28. 
Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Here's my summary. Jesus offers his disciples a life of rest in his service. Jesus offers his disciples a life of rest in his service. To understand that summary, we we break it down into three questions. Who is Jesus? What is he offering? Who is he offering it to? Who is Jesus? Before he reveals himself as king, we encounter him as a rabbi with his disciples. So the modern day equivalent would be uh, something like an instructor with his apprentices. It's that learning on the job, theory and practice woven into each other. One of the main things uh, a rabbi was supposed to do was impart wisdom of that nature. So wisdom would have included knowledge and morality, but it was more than both. It, uh, it was about knowing the facts. It was about understanding right from wrong, but it went further. Wisdom was about answering questions like, Should I speak up or keep quiet? Should I act now or later? Should we make our financial commitment conditional or not? Those are not questions that can be answered by the mere facts. Uh, They're not issues of right and wrong per se, but they are the stuff of everyday life. They're not purely factual. They're not purely moral. They're no less than moral or factual. They're kind of the messy ground messy middle ground that makes up most of our lives. Ultimately, wisdom was about making the right choices in that middle area, about living well in God's world. What does any of that have to do with our passage? You may be wondering. Two to three hundred years before Jesus, another Jewish rabbi by the name of Yeshua ben Sira wrote to his disciples, and it sounds, when you listen to it, it sounds a lot like Matthew 11. So just listen to this. How long will you deprive yourself of wisdom's food? How long endure such bitter thirst? I open my mouth and speak of her. Gain wisdom for yourselves at no cost. Take her yoke upon your neck that you may receive her teaching. A rabbi was supposed to impart wisdom. That was the rabbi's job description. For Ben Sira, that wisdom comes from following the rabbi's instruction. The rabbi's teaching is the yoke that the disciple is supposed to take upon her neck. She must bind herself to the rabbi's teaching. We hear echoes of what Rabbi Jesus says to his disciples, but there's a massive difference. You don't get your rest and satisfaction from wisdom. You get them from Jesus himself. You don't yoke yourself to wisdom. You yoke yourself to Jesus. You are not learning a book of pithy sayings and proverbs in abstract. You are learning a person. You're learning a person. Who is this Jesus? He's wisdom personified. Wisdom in the flesh. He is divine wisdom in human form. Discipleship is yoking yourself to the person of Jesus in total loving devotion. Binding yourself to him. And that will enable you to live well in God's world. Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is hidden from the wisdom of man. It's what he says in verse 25. But it is revealed to man by the wisdom of God, who is Jesus himself. Verse 29. Who is Jesus? Jesus is wisdom personified. Jesus is also Lord of the Sabbath. So have a look at the passage just after us. Matthew 12 verse 1. I'll read it for us. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry. They began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. When the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. He said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the bread of presence, which is not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And if you had 
known what, it, what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was the sign of the Mosaic Covenant. It was the symbol of the whole law that was given to Israel through the prophet Moses. As Lord of the Sabbath, Jesus is declaring authority over that law. And he exercises this authority not by abolishing the law, but by fulfilling the law. He did that by living the life the law required and dying the death the law required, both on behalf of a sinful humanity. He overrules the religious leaders by showing them the true meaning of Sabbath and the true meaning of law. The Sabbath was a symbol of the harmonious relationship between God and his people. That peace, that rest, that harmony is what the law was supposed to preserve and cultivate. And the Sabbath was the, was the symbol of all that. But the history of Israel teaches us, and if we're honest, our own experience teaches us that God is the only one who can achieve all this harmony and peace and rest because sinners don't, per definition, sinners don't want peace with God. We don't want it. And so peace with God depends on God's mercy towards those who don't want peace to begin with. It depends on God's mercy. That means mercy is right at the heart of the Sabbath and what it means. Now, this Jesus, as the fulfillment of the Sabbath, as the only one who could establish rest between God and his people, as the Son of the Father and the Son of Man, the mediator, as the cross-bearing embodiment of God's mercy to sinners, this Jesus has a unique authority to teach what the Sabbath means. He is Lord of the Sabbath. Are you with me? Who is Jesus? Wisdom in the flesh and our Sabbath rest with God. He's the answer to the question, how can I live well in God's world? He's also the answer to the question, how can I be at peace with God himself. If that's who Jesus is, what he offers starts to make a whole lot of sense, doesn't it? He offers rest. Rest for your soul. He is wisdom and Sabbath. He offers rest from folly and he offers rest from religion. Rest from the grinding agony of a life that just won't work, folly, Rest from the never-ending search for self-righteousness, religion. Let's face it, we are restless people. Two things primarily rob us of our rest. First, we can't get our lives to work. Your finances are a mess. Your relationships just keep falling apart. You can't hold down a job. You keep making poor decisions that blow up in your face. You keep saying the wrong things at the wrong time. You, you just can't get anything to work. It's painful, it's exhausting, it wears you down, at least it wears me down. But there's a second, deeper restlessness. And it's more profound, it's more essential, it's, it's the basis of our restlessness. A, mix of a, a kind of mix of guilt and insecurity. A deep, small voice like the faintest ring in your ear that'll drive you mad in the end. It says over and over again, you are not right with God. You are not truly loved. You are not truly loved. It's a fracture right at the center of our being. We know it's there. You see it in pop culture all the time. Uh, musicians sing about this all the time, even if they don't really understand it. So I just picked these at random. Imagine dragons, okay? Apologies if it's not your genre. Hear the lyrics. Look me in the eyes. Tell me what you see. Perfect paradise. Tearing at the seams. Or Lady Gaga. I'm falling. In all the good times I find myself longing for change. And in the bad times 
I fear myself. This thing is in all of us. So what do we do with it? Well, we try and drown out that voice. We plaster over the cracks. We swallow all manner of spiritual self-medication that says, I mean something. I'm good enough. I'm worthy of love. So it's our, it might be our achievements and accolades, education, career, community, sports field. Here at church, we build up something like a service CV. I'm involved in this many ministries. Uh, I give so many hours to the sound team. Apologies, guys, it's just a hypothetical example. Or to pastoral visitation. I haven't missed a funeral this year. I've been on parking duty five weeks in a row. And you know what? I just wish, I just wish others would have the same sort of commitment. And there it is. In that moment, the moment we make that comparison to others, we've slipped into the realm of self-justification. The motive for service is no longer God and his worth. The motive has very subtly, quietly, sneakily become about me and my worth. I can prove I'm worth it just by comparing myself to others. You know that we can even do this thing with Bible reading and prayer, extensive Bible knowledge, profound public prayers. They can become the source of the most prideful self-justification. So even precious gifts like Bible reading and prayer can be corrupted by this restless quest to make myself secure with God and with others. Karl Barth said, just, just because religion is the supreme possibility of all human possibilities, it becomes the working capital of sin. John Owen said, acting from self-strength by ways of self-invention towards the goal of self-righteousness is the soul and substance of false religion. And you know what? All of this work, this is the great tragedy of it all, it doesn't bring us any true and lasting rest because there's always that nagging doubt, that ringing in the ear. What if I haven't done enough? Or what if somebody else has done more? You always plagued with suspicions of guilt and insecurity and they make you nasty. They make you nasty because you constantly have to be proving that you're better than others and you may even start to believe it. Two things rob us of our rest. Our inability to make this world work and underneath that, giving birth to it if you like, our inability to make ourselves right with God, to earn his love. Now do you see what Jesus is offering when he says, come and rest. The rest he's offering is in the first place the end of this long dry search for love. The cross of Christ says two things to us, emphatically, two things. The first thing it says is you could never ever work your way to God's love. That's what the cross of Christ says. You could never do it. Think about it. The second thing the cross of Christ says is God's love has worked its way to you. You're never ever going to be innocent and secure in and of yourself. But Jesus is both. He's both and he's inviting you in. Come to me. Come close to me. Stay close to me. Come to my father with me on my merits. You know, if there was a set of pearly gates uh, with a St. Peter standing there guarding it and asking you, what are you doing here? There isn't, okay, but just go with me. If there was, all you would need to do is say, I'm with him. I'm with Jesus. And that would be enough. In fact, that's the only way in. Do you see what this means? It means you can finally stop your frenzied, relentless panic to prove your worth. You can stop. You can rest. Jesus has done it. You never could, but he has. 
True rest is knowing the Father through the Son. That's what it says in verse 27 and 28. True rest is knowing the Father through the Son. It's the only rest that lasts. It's the only rest there is. There's more. As you walk with Jesus, as you watch him, as you follow where he leads, a funny thing starts to happen. You start to look a bit like him. You start to say the things he would approve of, to do the things he might do. I mean, it may not even be conscious, but the longer you're with him, the more influence he has over who you are and what you do. I mean, that's just true of our ordinary friendships, isn't it? What do we keep telling our teenagers? Mind the company you keep. They will influence you. How much more will that be true of the most powerful, most beautiful, most magnetic person who ever lived? What we find as we walk with Jesus is that he's got a lot to say about money and sex and power. He's got a lot to show us about how to relate to different people, rich people, poor people, our family, our enemies. He has counsel on who to marry. He, he can help us in, by showing us what to look for in a leader or on how to spend our time or even on what, how, how we should dress. In fact, there isn't a major area of life that Jesus cannot help you with. If he doesn't say something explicitly or directly through his word, his character is always a sure and certain guide. Jesus is our wisdom. He points out so many of the pitfalls and potholes that make the journey of this life a painful grind. He keeps us on the path. He offers rest. And the rest he offers is being right with God and living well in God's world. One more thing about what Jesus is offering. He offers rest. He also offers work. In fact, he offers rest in work. Now, what on earth does that mean? A yoke. A yoke is the crossbar that hitches a pair of oxen to the plow. Right? But what is an ox? An ox is a beast of burden. Jesus says, take my yoke, it's easy, it's light, but you're still a beast of burden. You're still going to work. In fact, it's as you yoke yourself, just, just look at the, the logic of that verse, it's as you yoke yourself to Jesus, as you take on his burden, as you follow his lead, that you find rest for your soul. And that tells us that the rest Jesus is offering is not passive. So if you had in mind the couch or the hammock or the full body massage at the day spa, it's not what he's got in mind. Think about it. Just think about this for a second. Some of the most restless people you know are playboys or ladies of leisure. Always endlessly on holiday, but never truly at rest, at peace. Or let's flip it. Some of the hardest working people you know have a deep peaceful, calm, and poise about them. The rest Jesus offers is not a zero-sum game with work. So more work equals less rest, or less work equals more rest. No, it's not how it works. The rest Jesus offers may actually mean more work. It may. But it's not the anxious kind of work that obsessively tries to prove itself to God and earn his love. It's the joyful kind that wells up from a, from a deep assurance of God's love and a deep devotion to the Lord Jesus. It's not the kind of work that depletes because it's empty to begin with. It's the kind that energizes because it's so very full of meaning and purpose. It's the kind of rest that can fall into bed at the end of the day, utterly exhausted, utterly exhausted, but full of joy. And peace. Jesus is our wisdom and our Sabbath. He offers rest. Who does he offer it to? Verse, verses 25 to 30 make it clear that this invitation is not to the wise and the self-sufficient. It is to children 
who are weary and burdened. In other words, it's not for those whose pride is blinding them to their own need. It's for those who've come to the end of themselves. It's for those who, like children, know that they are dependent and helpless. If you are so busy being busy with your own salvation, you're not going to realize just how weary you are. You won't hear Jesus say, come. His invitation is not for you. Not yet, anyway. But if you are ready, perhaps even today, if you are ready to admit that you are exhausted, that you've got nothing left, that you are so very tired of trying on your own, that you are so weary of your sin, or, or weighed down and heavy laden with all your righteousness, your self-righteousness, if you want rest for your soul and you will take it like a child, then this, the sweetest of all invitations, is for you. It's for you. Jesus is our wisdom and our Sabbath. He offers rest to fools and sinners like you and me. And he's offering it today. So if that's who Jesus is, and that's what he's offering, well, what then does the life of discipleship look like? Three very practical words straight from our text. The life of discipleship is learning from Jesus, laboring for Jesus, coming to Jesus. Learn, labor, come. So we start with learning from Jesus. Verse 29, it's straight from the verse. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. This happens when we open God's word, when we share God's word in the power of his spirit. It's what, it's what we're doing right now. It's what we do Sunday by Sunday. We open God's word. We pray as hard as we possibly can, and I hope that you do. I hope that you do pray. We pray as hard as we can that God's spirit would be at work amongst us. Now, let me say the obvious. To learn from Jesus on a Sunday, you need to be here on a Sunday, right? I know you can listen to the sermons online, but that's not quite discipleship. Because remember, remember what discipleship is. It's learning Jesus apprenticeship style. That's theory and practice on the job. His word is not only to be heard and read, it needs to be lived. And to do that, you need other people. We need to gather with the family. You can't, you just can't privatize this faith. He won't let you. That's not learning Jesus. We need to be together on a Sunday. I don't need to tell you there's a whole lot of alternatives. There are a whole range of other places you could worship. Let's just list a few. The mall. The office. The laptop. The mountain bike. The trail run. The holiday resort. The house at the VAR. Kids extramurals. We live in this increasingly post-Christian society where Sunday is not, not really anything special anymore. And this seems to be a particular pressure point. Just chatting to, to many of you, this is a particular pressure point, uh, at least amongst our, our parents, those in the throes of getting their kids through school. Kids extramurals, kids official school activities on a Sunday morning. I think it comes down to this. Parents and the rest of us, you need to help us in this. What do you want for your child? Do you want the one in seven billion chance that he's the next Messi? Is that what you want? Or do you want him to be a disciple of Jesus? Because I can tell you this, if by some freak chance he is the next Messi, he is going to need Jesus. And so are you. And so you have to exercise your God-given responsibility as a parent and choose. And if you choose church, think about the message that sends to your kid. It says, learning Jesus is more important, even than this. Of course, the reverse is true. If you don't choose church, However you spin it to yourself or to your kids, you can't really get away from communicating that this under-12 trial for Gauteng judo is actually more important. And the next time you say Jesus is king, 
it's going to ring just a little bit hollow. Your kids are sharp. It's going to ring a little hollow. My friends, what we don't, desperately don't want to do is make Sunday church into some sort of rule for self-righteousness. But we do want to see it for what it is. It's a precious opportunity to learn Jesus. And I think if we see it for what it's really worth, there is no choice. You'll choose gathering with the family every time. We learn Jesus on a Sunday. We learn Jesus in life groups. Rafa and Christina did such a good job for us. If you're not in a midweek life group, you're going to struggle to learn Jesus. Sundays are indispensable, but they're just the beginning. Because as they were saying, in life groups, you have this unique opportunity to grow in your faith because we engage with God's word together. We grapple with it together. We ask questions. We, 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 we struggle over how does, this, how does this connect with our lives? And then you've got all these opportunities to put that faith into practice by loving the people in that group, by serving them, by carrying their burdens, by eating their biscuits, which sometimes is a labor of love. You get, to, you get to share your common struggles with sin. That, doesn't, that just doesn't happen on a Sunday. You don't walk out here and start telling someone about your dark places. It happens in relationship. Life groups are where the redeemed family of servants really happens in a unique way. It's where learning Jesus really happens in a unique way. And if you're not in one, you're stunting your own growth. Why would you do that? Join one today, straight after the service. Learning Jesus also happens in Explore, PTS, Foundations, one-to-one -one Bible reading, wherever we share the word in the power of the Spirit. Now, just an aside, remember, the goal in all of these things is not Bible literacy, as important as that is. Bible literacy, as good as that is, it can turn bad on us if we make it an end in itself. So universities are full of theology professors who know their Bibles backwards, but they want absolutely nothing to do with learning Jesus. We, want, we, don't want to, we don't want to be Bible experts. We want to hear the voice of God in his words so that we can be disciples of Jesus. Those are two different things. I hope you see that. Discipleship is a life of learning from Jesus. It's a life of laboring for Jesus Verse 29 again, take my yoke upon you. This thing called discipleship should carry a warning on the label. Danger, explosive. Because spending time with Jesus will mean that you won't want to sit still. You won't settle for passive. You will start to care for the things your king cares for. You will you'll want to love your brothers and sisters at church in very practical ways. You will want to serve the poor, you will have a, a zeal for the lost. And there's no end to the opportunities. Again, a, a good place to start is life groups. If you're joining a life group, you are joining a group of people that need you. And by the way, you need them. You need them. So join a group. And then after that, speak to Helen, speak to Kate. Ask about the other ministries, because I can guarantee you, it doesn't matter what ministry you get involved in, so you don't have to Chew endlessly over this thing. Just join one, and there you're going to find people that you can love and serve. That ministry is going to be an opportunity to labor for Jesus. Do you know that every single non-believer you know is an opportunity to labor for Jesus? Every single one, to love them, to care for them, to pray for them, to risk offending them with the gospel. So opportunities to labor for Jesus are not the problem. That's not the issue. There's no shortage of them. The problem is motive. And with this we end. Discipleship is a life of learning from Jesus. It's a life of laboring for Jesus. And it's a life of coming to Jesus. But not in that order. You notice from our passage, the rest comes before the yoke. The rest comes before the yoke. It's come, labor and learn. Because the kingdom of heaven, Martin made this point so strongly for us last week, the kingdom of heaven is upside down. In the world, we work Monday to Friday so that we can rest on the weekend. But in the kingdom, you don't just 
work towards a place of rest, you work from a place of rest. You work from a place of rest. Our work can be easy and light. It can be a delight. It can be a joy. It's a form of rest even when it's hard, even when we are hacking back thorns and thistles. We can rest. We can rest in the truth that the work has been done. He has done the work. It is finished. And that's the rest he invites us to. So if you find, on the one hand, that you are lazy, or on the other hand, that you are so very, very worn out, if you are restless because you have no meaningful work, or you are restless because your work will give you no rest, then you need to hear this invitation again and again. Hear it from the pen of John Owen. This is what he writes. The word which Jesus now speaks to you is this. Why will you die? Why will you perish? Why will you not have compassion on your souls? Can your hearts endure or your hands be strong on the day of wrath that is approaching? Look to me and be saved. Come to me. And I will ease you of all sins, all sorrows, all fears, all burdens, and give rest to your souls. Come, I entreat you, lay aside all procrastinations, all delays. Put me off no more. Eternity lies at the door. Jesus says to every single one of us here this morning, come to me, all you who are laden weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The life of discipleship is accepting that invitation every single day. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so very much with all that we are and all that we have. We thank you for your son. We thank you for the rest he offers to sinners and fools like us. Help us to accept his invitation. Help us to come to labor and to learn. Help us to rest in Christ. Amen.